Good morning, Zion. Good to be back with you today. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Ezekiel 37, the first 14 verses. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Zion, now that the warm weather is here, I've been trying to get outside. And so I purchased a new bike recently. My friend Joseph, who lives here in the city of Oshawa, uh, he has this small business, you could say. He purchases old bikes that are in need of repair, he fixes them up, and then he resells them, giving the new bike and the owner a new lease on life. But as I've been cycling this week, I've been woken up to a very harsh reality. I'm out of shape. It's been a little while since I've been on my bike. And so as I was cycling this week, I quickly found that I was breathless. I was tired after about five minutes. And I wasn't quite sure whether the stream down my face was sweat or tears. But I made it to my destination, bound and determined. Not even an hour later, though, I was driving down the road, feeling pretty good about getting back into shape and feeling pretty decent about my latest bike ride, when something horrific happened. It was almost as if some external force came over me as I looked up and saw the invitational glow of those golden arches. Suddenly, I felt my arms turning, guiding the steering wheel towards those pearly gates. And next thing I knew, I was eating an Oreo McFlurry, sitting in the pit of my own guilt and despair, having to face two conflicting images. 
William, the bound and determined, motivated cyclist. And Mick William, the McFlurry eating enthusiast. So here I was, having caved to my craving in a moment of weakness, the desire for ice cream having overcome my willpower to get in shape. All that was left to do was sit there with my guilt and stare at those three well-known words that seemed to just mock me in the moment. I'm loving it. Here in Ezekiel 37, the people of Israel find themselves in a pit of their own despair after being confronted with two conflicted images within themselves. You see, Israel is a nation that is known for being the people of God. In fact, it was paramount to their identity as a nation, but also to their identity as individuals. It was what set them apart from everyone else. It was what made them unique compared to the nations that surrounded them. However, when God sends Ezekiel to his people, it is to confront them because they're living their own very different reality. God sends Ezekiel to warn Israel that the way they are living doesn't line up with God's way. As the people of God, you see, Israel's calling was to show the holiness of who God was, the holiness of God's name through how they lived. But their identity as the people of God seems to have no impact on what is a very disobedient lifestyle. They worship other gods. They indulge in detestable acts, says Ezekiel. A nation claiming to be a people of God, people of a holy God, live anything but holy lives. In fact, they turn the temple, this place of worship, a place to worship God in his holiness, into an unholy place. Israel claims to be different, but they might as well just be like all of the rest of the nations. So God tells Ezekiel to go to the people of Israel in this place. People who have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. A nation of rebels who have rebelled against me, says God, a faithless bride. And so Ezekiel brings this warning. He says, how sick is your heart, declares the Lord. And yet even after a pretty stark warning like this one, Even after an invitation to come back to God's holiness, they remain stubborn. They're content to keep on living just the way they are. They're satisfying every desire and they're loving it. So much so that God's warning just doesn't register with them. Their desire, you see, has consumed their hearts. And so God follows through on his word to his people. God's glory actually leaves the temple, for the place of worship has become a lifeless institution. God uses the nations around them to send to the nation of Israel in order to put them into exile. And so the once great nation of Israel is now displaced from their home, their place of worship is destroyed, And along with it, their identity is shattered. Desire is a powerful force. It has a way of growing slowly at first, but to the point where it takes over. Ancient Greek mythology saw that within each one of us, there was this spirit. The spirit that dwells within our hearts. And they called this spirit a daemon where we get our word demon from. And this daemon, this several-headed beast within our hearts, fed on desire. And as we would feed this monster, it would continue to eat and feed on these desires. It would grow larger and larger. Its appetite would eventually become insatiable to the point 
where it couldn't be filled anymore. All of this would lead to our eventual destruction as we try to attempt to satisfy the appetite of what is now an uncontrollable monster, said the ancient Greeks. This here is the catastrophe of Israel. You see, desire had grown so large that it had consumed the heart of the people of God. Choked on the weeds of desire, the heart shrivels. Without the heart, all that remains is a heap of lifeless, dry bones. And so here we have Israel, once God's people, and Mick Israel, now a valley of dry bones, crying out in lament. Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. And so as Ezekiel looks out over this valley of dry bones, this catastrophic image, this flaming hot mess of death and destruction, God asks him this question. He says, son of man, can these bones live? Now, prophets are like pastors in that they always have something to say. And yet, looking at this hopeless pit, Ezekiel the prophet can only utter, Sovereign Lord, only you know. We all share something in common. In fact, we are more alike than we are unalike. Bruce Springsteen sings our common ground, saying everybody's got a hungry heart. We are, all of us, creatures of desire. Jamie Smith, professor of philosophy at Kelvin University, puts it this way. He says, you are what you love. We've experienced the all-too-real pull of desire that plays on our heartstrings like a skilled puppet master. The pull of one string causes our arms to turn into that McDonald's drive through for an innocent snack. The pull of another string causes our fingers to write a slightly higher number so that we just benefit a little bit more on our tax return this year. Our mouse is drawn to that link that we know just leads to nowhere good. Desire takes many shapes and forms. Some can be big, some can be smaller. But the power remains the same. Over time, the pull of one string leads to another. Each desire becoming slightly more pronounced the appetite slightly larger until we find ourselves in a never-ending cycle of trying to fill what can't be filled until we find ourselves chanting along with the age-old philosophy of the Rolling Stones because I try and I try and I try, I just can't get no satisfaction. Desire is nothing new. In fact, it is desire that leads to this catastrophic fall of humanity into sin at the beginning of time. You see, God makes humanity, Adam and Eve, in his image and places them in the garden to care for it. The garden's an abundant place. It's teeming with life. Everything that you think of imaginable is there in abundance. And God tells Adam and Eve, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And as the story goes, Satan comes to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent and tempts them. You will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan tempts Adam and Eve. He appeals to their desire. And when they satisfy that desire, they become aware of their nakedness. And humanity becomes clothed in shame 
for the first time. Exiled from the garden in that shame, sit Adam and Eve in a pit of despair, withered hearts in the valley of dry bones. Our hope is gone. We are cut off. Herein lies the dilemma for each one of us, though. If all of humanity draws from the same source, the human heart, and if we are indeed creatures of desire, is there hope for us? Or are we destined to be stuck in the endless spiral of chasing desire until it consumes us fully? Are we fighting a battle that we cannot win? Can these bones really live? We too find ourselves in the same pit as Israel. We know what it's like to be overcome by desire. We know that feeling of guilt all too well when we satisfy the darker longings of our hearts. Like Adam and Eve, we don't feel that we can face God in this place of guilt and shame. And like Israel, we count all but loss. Yes, our hope is gone. We too are cut off. And with no hope that we can fix it, we embrace our bony lives and eat our desire one spoonful at a time. These bones can't live, we tell ourselves. I even wonder if such a thought was going through Ezekiel's mind as he looks out at this catastrophic image of dry bones. Did Ezekiel wonder if there was hope for the nation of Israel? Did he have any hope that they could live once again? God meets us in this place of doubtful questioning and hopeless despair. In fact, God tells Ezekiel who's looking at these hopeless, despairing, dry bones, to prophesy over the bones. Dry bones, listen to the message of God. As Ezekiel prophesies, something magnificent and humanly impossible starts to happen. As I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them. A skin had covered them. Just as in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, it is if almost like creation is taking place a second time. But this act is not done yet, you see, because something is missing. While the body was formed, there was no breath in them. And so God says, prophesy, prophesy to the breath. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Now there's one Hebrew word that ties together this exciting image before us. This word is ruach, meaning breath, wind, spirit. It is the same word used in Genesis 2 when the spirit of God hovers over the waters, creating a sense of anticipation that something, something's about to happen here. When God breathes breath into humanity, at their creation. It is this same breath, this same wind, this same spirit of God that breathes and moves and that brings this sense of anticipation. When Israel cries, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone, we are cut off, it is this breath, this creating breath that continues to breathe and move now here in the valley. My people, God says, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel, and then you, my people, will know 
that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then, then, then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. God comes alongside a people who cry out, our hope is gone, we are cut off. God meets these people in the valley of their own brokenness, and he fills their bottomless pit of desire with the gift of his spirit, his presence. A gift that not only fills the bottomless hole, but causes it to overflow with abundance. God brings his dry-boned people out of the grave, and he brings them back to life. God looks Mick Israel in the eye and calls them my people once again. This is God's work of recreating that which was broken. This is God's act of new creation, restoring life to the lifeless, meeting human impossibility with God possibility taking a people overwhelmed with desire and overwhelming them with his mercy, taking us in our sin and our brokenness and making us new. This is God's work, a work of grace. This is the power of God's spirit, a work of new life, a work of transformation. Just as God forms the bodies of Adam and Eve at the beginning of time, putting flesh on their bones and filling them with breath in the Garden of Eden, so too does God's Spirit transform and rebuild the bone-dry nation of Israel by doing a transformative work in each human heart. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This is God's promise. A heart made stone by unfulfilled desire, God replaces with a heart that is living and beating. A heart that is filled with his spirit. A heart made in the image of its creator. A heart that lives and beats in the desire of the Lord. Author and theologian C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory, says that we are half-hearted creatures, fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased, Lewis says. Lewis gets it. As humans, we cannot not have desires. We were created to desire, to love. This is the beautiful thing about God, though. You see, God doesn't make us incapable of desire. In fact, desire is a gift from God. But the work of God's Spirit helps us to reorder these desires, to recenter and direct our hearts once again towards their first love, a loving relationship with our Creator. This must be the first desire of our hearts. This was the desire that Israel had lost. This is the desire that we often 
lose ourselves. Theologians refer to this work of the Spirit as the process of sanctification, a large word, but simply put, a process, a journey of becoming holy and Christ-like, set apart. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul refers to this process, this sanctification, as waking up. He writes to the church in Rome, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night, it's nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Paul says put off those things and instead clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Clothe yourselves with Christ, Paul says. This is the call to all of us as humanity made in God's image. That image hasn't left. Find that image again by clothing yourselves with Christ. We were but a heap of dry bones in our sinful desires, but God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. We didn't do this. In fact, we couldn't do this ourselves. But perhaps this is the biggest problem of all. We can often try to resist what God is doing. Our hearts, though weary, are often unwilling. We try so hard to dig ourselves out of the pit, to save ourselves, until we realize, yet again, we can't. We've tried again and again, but we keep finding ourselves in the same pit of desire, feeling empty, frustrated, guilty, and ashamed, cut off and hopeless. Church, brothers and sisters, Zion, hear this on this Pentecost Sunday. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We cannot save ourselves. We're pulled off that track. We're pulled away from our first love. But God doesn't leave us He doesn't just watch us veer off. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. He has given us this gift. And with this God-given power, you, me, all of us are called out of the pit. God created you. He has breathed into you. You are made in God's image. You are filled with God's Spirit. Because you are his beloved child from day one and today. When humanity fell into sinful desire, God didn't abandon that image that he put within each one of us. When we stopped delighting in God, God didn't stop delighting in his beloved creation. And so when we were dead in our sin, God did what we couldn't. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And when he did, he defeated the power of those sinful desires. In fact, he defeated death itself. So that when God shows up on the scene, when God breathes his spirit, flesh reappears, sinews form on our dry bones, and a new heart is placed within us. We are formed in God's image. And because of that, we are transformed by God's grace. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, 
He who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine, my people, my beloved. And so we're faced with a question this morning. What are the desires on each of our hearts? Perhaps you find yourself feeling less than spirit-filled this morning. Perhaps, in fact, you find yourself sitting in the pit of hopelessness and despair along with Israel. This work of the Holy Spirit is a process, but it requires something from us. God does all the work but he requires a willing spirit. In fact, in Psalm 51, this is David's prayer as he looks at this overwhelming act of mercy. And David prays, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. People of God, God has not taken the presence of his Holy Spirit from us. He has put the Holy Spirit, this gift, into each one of us to work this amazing, grace-filled act of new creation. And so Zion, let that be our prayer this morning. Let us each pray for a willing spirit, willing to experience and live in the joy of salvation. God breathes his spirit into you. You are spirit-filled people. You didn't have to do a thing. God did it all. And now God calls you, his beloved child, to be witnesses to this work, to be willing to experience the power of this gift, this gift that he has given, this gift that is for you and for me. It's not a gift of hopelessness. In fact, it's a gift of hope. It's a gift of new life. And so we are invited to grab hold of that new life to to wake up from our slumber and to live that life that God has called us to live, to live it fully, to go knowing that the Spirit gives us the courage that we need gives us the comfort when we're feeling overwhelmed in the pit and does that thing within us, that saving act that we couldn't do ourselves. This is what we are called to witness to. Have you experienced it this morning? Are you willing to experience that this morning? There was an image that was told to me this week we often don't get to see the Holy Spirit. And that's where we can get a bit skeptical sometimes. The Holy Spirit was described to me like this. There was a boy who was flying a kite in a field. The wind picked up, and eventually it took this kite higher and higher and higher up into the sky. So an elderly gentleman was walking by, walking his dog, and looks over and sees a boy standing in a field holding a piece of string. He says, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm flying a kite. Well, how, how do you know it's there? I can feel it, the boy says. Holy Spirit's not something we can measure. It's not something we can rationalize. That's often my problem. But I like to be in control. And so the Spirit, God, invites us to give that control back to him so that he can do that work, 
that new creation in each one of us. So this Pentecost, let's return that control to where it belongs. Let's open our hearts to the work of God's Spirit this morning, knowing that it's a gift he's given and we are his children. Will you pray with me? And so God, we give you thanks. We are humbled by this gift, overwhelmed by this gift. God, your spirit meets us in this place of despair as we just become honest with ourselves that we can't save ourselves. And so God, we open our hearts to you once again. Where our hearts have become stone, would you remove them and replace them with hearts that beat and live in the power of your spirit? Would you assure us that when we are afraid to surrender control, that we don't have to fear, for you are redeeming us. You have redeemed us. And so God, we come to this place of surrender this morning, this Pentecost Sunday. God, fill our weary hearts with hope again. God, help us to look to you our Lord and our Savior. The one who gives us the strength and the courage to go from this place filled with your spirit, changed, transformed, made new. God, we pray for those in this congregation who find themselves despairing over health, who find themselves in a place of hopelessness or uncertainty. God, we need the healing power of your spirit. God, when we feel tired, when we feel anxious, when we feel that we don't have the ability or the gifts to live out your mission, would you give us the strength and courage that comes from you? Would you remind us of who we are not make Israel, but your people. God, fill this church with the power of your spirit. Continue to move and breathe in our reality today, a world filled with so much uncertainty and unknown. God, remind each one of us that you are alive, that you are moving that your kingdom is here. God, remind us that we are alive in you. Your spirit is within us. God, we pray for Pastor Brad and Julie and Micah and Georgia as they can get some well-deserved rest this weekend. We thank you for Pastor Brad and for the gift that he is to our church community. And so, God, would you continue to fill him with your spirit as he continues to teach us your word and to invite the spirit into our hearts. God, we thank you for Diana, for Resonate. We thank you for John and Marion and for Wycliffe and for the work that you are doing through these beautiful missionaries, through these agencies worldwide. God, your kingdom is so much greater than we can imagine. Continue to open our eyes and our hearts to that kingdom before us. Continue to fill us with your spirit so that we can come alongside your kingdom work and be your servants. God, we give ourselves to you. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come.